This is the third book in a poem, a book-length poem in progress called To Banquet with the Worthy Ethiopians, a memoir of life before the alphabet. And the, the book or the chapter is called Achilles' Shield. Now, the thing about Achilles' Shield, it's, it's really a remarkable uh, piece of technology forged by the lame god Hephaestus after Achilles' armor has been stripped from Achilles' best friend Patroclus and is now being worn by his adversary uh, Hector. So Hector has Achilles' old armor and Achilles is naked and we see him at one point on the rampart completely naked screaming in rage and grief uh, and with such power that the Trojans uh, qu uh, quaver and, and retreat. But the shield, which occupies almost an entire book, the description of the shield, almost an entire book, book 19, is uh, the only place in the Iliad where Homer leaves the field of battle and leaves the Trojan plain and describes life in the domestic world, weddings, farming, um, a lawsuit, uh, as well as small battles and, and, and fights and things like that. And of course, it's all engraved upon this terrible weapon of battle. In a way, I think that what I'm getting at here is the fact that any of our descriptions uh, in writing, in the chirographic world, in some way are bound to be on a, on a golden tableau, frozen, and are somehow inauthentic. And I think that in many ways, our alphabet culture, our, our written culture, the poetry from that culture is a long, complex lament for our inability to have lines that are, that are conceived and spoken in one breath. The epigraph for this uh, chapter is from Heraclitus, who said, Homer should be taken out of the canon and whipped. He was wrong to say, would that strife should perish from the world. He did not see that he was praying for the destruction of the universe. Everything emerges from and is made necessary by strife. When Homer's knife rives Heraclitus' heart and strife finally perishes from the world, then the sea between the summer of 265 and the shelf where I secrete my list of shame will undulate, turn by dream toss turn in the belly of a room, a rippling house whose roof tree is a rocking, chanting child. I close my eyes. Back and forth, heels to palms, he glides, his flank ruined, alight with primal ronger. His song is ungrounded utterance, which I translate to amend the poet's prayer. Let strife finally perish from the word. Let the alphabet be unstrung and the paragraphs of W.H.D. Rouse be dismantled. Let lines be birthed and spoken in one breath. Let us all be whole, be one. Let us all sail home. But in the silent office where I brood, paroled by Agamemnon, who unsheathed my heart and stitched in livid script, time proceeds under the tireless sun. And the child's song, if he sings, cannot be heard, or heard can't be interpreted. What remains between moon and cup is a burnished shield, hammered into syntax by a god. Blind fingers trace enamel script, metal scorches, beaten edges cut, no eyes or hand can pierce the scrim. 
Without the child rocking in the house of his own making, this is all there is of the distant summer on my list of shame. A twice-notched, jewel-encrusted page, figured with magnificent designs, the beaked moon, Pleiades, the bear, and beneath gleaming bronze tableaus of a clay tennis pavilion, tawny as an urn, broiling under a monstrance of sunlight. The great beamed clubhouse swept for games, the queen of heaven's shrine and the pine cabins, and the emerald dappled bay of the squire's camp. I trace my livid script. I bend my cheek to the grayed leaf that muffles the child's song, but hear only a barrage of battle cries. Not the stilted expletives that Rouse stuffs into the mouth of Menelaus. Sarpedon, you are a great high counselor among your own people, but what are you doing skulking here, an unwarlike fellow like you? Now, the war cries in the bunk were spiced with secrets. You prick, you cunt, you douche, you twat, you slit. From reveille to taps they ululated. Screw you, your mother, your face, my ass, your schlong. A self-generating resuscitif. Dipshit, asshole, cocksucker, dildo, scumbag. Strifes, totems, disfigured privy walls, ru mu mushrooms, rockets, cilia spouting specimens from school biotexts, the war cries, sharpened teeth, brazed knuckles. They tore the scabs off elbows, whittled stairs. Once, Winkles flashed a bodice ripper he'd stolen from his father's bottom drawer, and for days the war cries morphed to Cunny, Quim, Roger, Bugger, Bunghole. Embedded in the all-encompassing shield, archived in each kick and slap and punch, in the cicada's fury and the shadow's leer and the untimely palpitations of each heart, Strife, a goddess, snarled her syllables. The fiercest war cry and the most taboo was the syllable of Aegis bearing Zeus. It could be howled or muttered, hissed or gestured. It was capable of conjugation. It invoked divine or scatological. It signified, I cannot be touched. It meant, Escape this bag of skin. It said, I am a knife, you a sheath. It intimated, I will unveil death. The first I ever heard the Aegis uttered. I was buried in Book Five, where swift Odysseus thrusts a spear into the buttocks of Pericles. The point pushes through, piercing the bladder. I raised my head and saw on the windy beach a boy's cheek ground into sand. His unveiled eye marbled, one lip oozed blood. It was Floss. Straddling his writhing belly was Anteater, expert at war cries. With his face crushed under Anteater's heel and one arm twisted hard behind his back, Floss would not cry uncle and instead spat out the Aegis. In book five, the lethal syllable froze Odysseus in mid-thrust. On the beach, Anteater ungripped and stepped away. I confess that although I voyaged to this beach from Queens, and although I practiced in the bathroom mirror, hip thrust and guffaw and snapping towel, and although I combed rouse for hidden clues, I did not know exactly what the war cries cried for. As for the Aegis syllable, I'd rifled the inventory of cognates. I knew it stemmed from German for to strike, but its true signification remained veiled. In Rouse, unveiled meant undone. 
There was Helen stripped to serve a shamed Paris, Hector hogtied, Thersites flogged, and the queen of heaven strapadoed from the moon. Throughout the squires of Columbus lamp, camp, on walls and votive lamps, and around throats hung totems of unveiled, disfigured gods. A ghostly bird, a burning heart cut out, a child affixed in a panoply of dread humiliation, arms outstretched, torso sculpted down to the starved rib. Fearfully, I traced his cambered knees, kissed the nipple nailed to his slim feet. Had his umber cheek been ground fine into sand? It might be Thersites. It might be bird or heart. It might be Achilles naked on the rampart, arms outstretched. The night after the day that Floss bred, bled, I wandered the beach beneath the Pleiades and, and glimpsed a shadow cowled beneath a boat. Creeping closer, I saw Odysseus, and from beneath his crouching form, over the growl of surf, I heard a cry. Fucking shit, hissed Anteater between clenched teeth, a fist pumping his groin. Holy fuck Jesus fucking Christ! Heraclitus, if your heart's unsheathed palpitating air, no need to fear. The morning Homer left the rocking house. Strife ground his cheek into the page, and heaven, earth, sea, the untiring sun, cities of mortal men, dancers whirling, shepherds, vineyards, farmland, sheaves of wheat, every harmonious note the child had sung, even the slim foot of strife herself, hardened into gleaming bronze tableaus forged by a lame god for a killer's shield. And Homer is not blind, though his eyes are marble. He is a child staked at the pith of a burning city, his naked pelt crucified in time. <laughs>